Hello everyone, this was an episode on um, Bitcoin toxicity or maximalism that is exercised on people that are new to the communi community. Uh, we had a really fun time discussing this because personally Keegan and I haven't really had the experience of being attacked on the internet but we've seen many instances of it and people talking about it on other podcasts so we decided to address it and compare it to some other instances in life where somebody you know is better tells you what you should or should not do but that isn't necessarily helpful if you're you're just entering a new field so hopefully there are some points in there that if you have been attacked on the internet um, you can relate to and um, just so you know we empathize with you if you want to reach back out and talk to us about it our ears are always open our e email is always open for you and i uh, hope you find value in listening to this this is this discussion all right let's begin the episode the thoughts and opinions expressed by keegan francis Murgakshi palway and the guests interviewed on the go full crypto podcast are solely their own the content discussed are intended to be for informational purposes only Keegan, can you give me an instance of when you were into any one particular activity, but then somebody who had been in that activity for longer came along, saw what you were doing, and was condescending to you about it? I actually feel like music is a little like that. I remember having a teacher in high school, and he was, he was a great musician. He played the guitar and the drums, but he would... Yeah, he was very condescending. He was a very condescending teacher. Uh, he was like, I, I know it all and I'm trying to help you, but I'm also uh, like trying to teach you in like an, in a very abrasive method. It was a very toxic way of teaching. If you've ever seen the movie Whiplash, oh. it was kind of like that guy, but uh, but on like a lesser level because that guy was just crazy. So you're saying that like, what instrument did you play? Uh, well, I played the percussion. Um, so, so I didn't have like a, a too, too difficult of a job, but I would more so notice him, um, uh, I guess, bullying other students rather than, um, yeah, it, it, he just looked like a bully to me. And then I was on, oh, I also played piano in the jazz band. That's, that's when I experienced the brunt of, of his negativity. Can you give me an example or an instance? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, it's really in music, it's really important that you play with confidence, even if you're playing wrong, um, confident, wrong music sounds better than non-confident <laughs> wrong music. <laughs> um, and so he was illustrating a point. Um, I was supposed to be playing a solo in jazz and, uh, he's like, okay, no, 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 stop. This is how you do it. And then he sat there and he's like, look, I have no idea how to play piano and I'm just going to play it. And it's like, this is uh, much easier this way. Like, it's, uh, I don't know how you can't do this. It's like, how are you not understanding this? Uh, things like that. That was, that was the kind of, I don't know if that satisfies your example. but uh, Yeah, well, um, essentially what I'm gathering is he knew better, obviously, because he was your teacher. If he didn't know better, then he would not be in the position that he wasn't. However, he definitely knew better. He didn't exercise his uh, more his knowledge um exceeding knowledge over yours he didn't really exercise showing that to you in the kindest possible way right i would say he didn't execute it with grace okay or, or humility okay cool well the reason why i asked you that is because you know, i was working on um a, a ted fud buster or i am working on a, a ted tether sorry tether fud buster show and i was listening to um, this video of someone explaining to people how Tether, the, the cryptocurrency, the stablecoin Tether, is either a huge Ponzi scheme, um, bigger than Bernie, no, Bernie Madoff, B Bernie Madoff, Bernie Madoff yep. or it's uh, essentially just a, a really big money printer where people are not people are not made aware of what's happening. Wow. And so there's no room for legitimacy there, right? Eh? Well, yeah, I know the, the if or R is really not siding with Tether at all. But the, the point is in that video, I was talking about FUD. This is FUD. Everybody who is in Tether is going to say this is FUD, 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 FUD. And FUD stands for fear, uncertainty and doubt. And 
um, I in the cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem over the past year and a half, when I've been more public about my opinions, I've noticed that there's people that take sides and some believe strongly over one thing, while some believe strongly over another thing, while some are just ambivalent. I mean, there's so many shades of people um, and the way that they exercise their consistence in investing in a particular kind of philosophy or wanting to promote another kind of cryptocurrency, you know, whatever it may be. The reason for me asking you that question is because that has sort of culminated into a a condescending, cultish, righteous toxicity within the cryptocurrency community. And that's what I wanted to address on this particular episode here today. Right. So toxic maximalism is one thing, like Bitcoin maximalism. But if you venture into other cryptocurrency communities, that toxic toxicity exists in more or less the same form in other areas, right? So we've got toxic XRP army people, and then we've got toxic Ethereum people. And we've uh, any cryptocurrency that people believe is the be all end all will, it seems, breed this this talk kind of toxicity. Yeah, it's kind of like um, your teacher where he knew better and he, instead of showing you how to do things a particular way, was uh, being a know-it-all and saying, well, you should do it this way. Why is it hard for you to not do it this way? Relating that to, well, you should be in Bitcoin. Why is it so hard for you to not stay in Bitcoin? And why is it hard for you to avoid getting distracted by investing in all of these other shitcoins? Yeah, I think that there's a bit of a difference, though, because my teacher actually did know better, right? He actually had the experience and the knowledge and the and could demonstrate why he knows better. Um, whereas I, I don't think that that kind of knowledge exists in some of these toxic communities, right? So you get a lot of memes coming out of uh, like, have fun staying poor, right? That's that's one of the memes. Have fun staying poor. That's one of the things that Bitcoin maximalists say to uh, to anyone who who invests in altcoins or or is staying in fiat. Um, and that's doesn't really demonstrate that you know anything about why Bitcoin is a great investment. It just it's just the thing that you say. It's a mantra. It's um oh this is a terrible analogy, but it's like Heil Hitler, right? It's uh it's it's saying it's just the thing that you say that sh that shows that you have pledged allegiance to this uh, this dogma or this ideology rather than engaging in an intelligent discussion about the merits of Bitcoin and why it stands up well or properly against other cryptocurrencies. Uh, but I feel like um, your analogy is oh gosh I don't know if I can say it's valid or not but. Um, People who have heard saying that have put out knowledge and education on why what they what they believe in is what they believe in and why they have such a strong belief of it. Some people do, and I, yeah, that's that's great. That's a better step forward than to just spout the memes like "have fun staying poor." Yeah, but so with respect to "have fun staying poor," I think that's more of a marketing thing because, uh, uh, like. Someone is going to want to be curious about why someone said that if they have something to lose. So if you hear, oh, have, staying, have fun staying poor, you're going to be on your toes and be like, why? Why Why are you saying this to me? What, what would you mean have fun staying poor? And I know that it's negatively impacting somebody else, but people um, in, I think, in just the marketing world, and if there's any marketing experts out there, feel free to correct me. But I've noticed that saying that you're going to lose out on something it excites someone or um yeah you poke them gets with fear. them to take an action fast faster than if you say to someone oh do this and you'd gain something right yeah um well i don't exactly agree with that because i think that you need to have the context of of that phrase uh like if you're a new person and you come into the cryptocurrency space and you're thinking of bitcoin as all the rest of the cryptocurrencies right they're all just they're all just cryptocurrencies bitcoin's not special in any way and you ask about uh, stellar lumens or you ask uh, about Ave or, or whatever, then you're faced with the response of, oh, have fun staying poor. Like, oh, I <laughs> like that you're asking about those coins. Wow. Right. Like that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of mentality that the Bitcoin maximalists, uh, the toxic Bitcoin maximalists um, breed. Like if you go on Clubhouse and not try to ask a question about uh, various cryptocurrencies, you, you might get booted off the stage. 
right? Your question might not even be answered. Whereas I would much rather see people uh, be much more patient. And if, if you're up on Clubhouse and you're hosting a Bitcoin session and someone asks a, a question about another cryptocurrency, I don't care really how many times you have to repeat uh, the, the answer. You should, ha you should repeat the answer. Like if you're actually standing there for Bitcoin and, and supporting it, and you should be able to stand the repetition of those questions. And I know that's frustrating, but... I disagree with that. Cool. Let's hear why. Uh, well, you're saying that someone should do that. And well, I, should's a dangerous word, right? Should is a very dangerous word, especially if you're talking about it on some on, on what somebody else should or must do. So with respect to um, people that have been in the community for longer, and they did the legwork of educating people about Bitcoin five years ago, and they did answer all of the questions that people will obviously always continue to ask five years ago, they probably have reached a point where they're like, oh, well, you know, I've already put out all of this information out there. If somebody's interested in hearing what I have to say, then they can just go out and see the content that's that's already been um, been put out on the internet. Yeah, but I don't have to repeat myself every single time. At that point, don't host a, a beginner Bitcoin session then and, uh, well, and shut down questions that beginners will inevitably have. I've... Right? Yeah, well, I, I don't know if this was on a big, big, uh, sorry, beginner in Clubhouse or whatever, because I haven't experienced that. But if you have, then. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that's one of the things I've had. I, had. I think that we should maybe um, take this conversation in a slightly different direction and talk about what the toxic mask, uh, maximalist um, perspective is all about. Why does it exist in the first place? And if uh, I'm not sure, like if we have some like very avid Bitcoiners uh, in our audience, but uh, in the last week, there's this individual named Robert Breedlove, and we've talked about him on the podcast several times. He's written several notable and very popular pieces about Bitcoin uh, throughout the last couple of years, and he's a highly respected individual. But in the last two weeks, he uh, he sold something called BitCloud. BitCloud is, uh, as far as I understand it, just another cryptocurrency. It uh, it represents uh, ownership over your profile on the on the website BitCloud. It's uh, like a tokenized social media website of sorts. And he sold that BitCloud that was more or less airdropped or gifted to his account, and and he sold it for Bitcoin. And he tweeted about it. And the the toxic Bitcoin community um, just jumped on him. And uh, and then he put out something. He put out a statement a couple of days ago and likened the toxic uh, mask uh, maximalists to a the auto an autoimmune disorder of uh, of Bitcoin. And the way that that analogy goes is that the toxic maximalists are the immune system, right? They protect Bitcoin. That when people are spreading fud or when people are uh, dissenting or creating fake news or um, spreading false narratives about Bitcoin, it, it is usually these these maximalists and that that take to arms, right? They they um they're the ones that go and fight the battles that need to be fought on behalf of Bitcoin for everyone else. Otherwise, these narratives just get spun out of control, and so they're actually performing a pretty vital service. Uh, where I draw the line is being respectful and not basically not being toxic but uh that that word is also subjective what's toxic to me might not be toxic to you and yeah. what's respectful to me might not be respectful to you uh, but i think what happened to robert was that uh he had all the support from the bitcoin community two weeks prior but as soon as he tweeted about about bit clout uh the, the community just totally wrecked him and and uh, dissented from him and uh, was was not on board with his decision making process whatsoever. Right on. Well, what what did you want to point out about that? Uh, just that I, I wanted to provide some context around what the what the point of Bitcoin maximalism is, and what the point what these individuals do, and why they have done it in the first place. So, like in twenty fourteen, there was a really good reason to be a Bitcoin maximalist if you were a Bitcoiner because, well, Bitcoin was only five years at the time and there's all of these other new coins and projects coming out that could have reasonably actually 
overtaken Bitcoin um, because much of the narrative around like Bitcoin not having a leader and, and uh, Bitcoin being the king of cryptocurrency, that wasn't as well established as it is now. Right. And then we had the four cores of 2017. So the people that fought the four cores and, and, and won it and like kept Bitcoin um, in its position that it is in now, those are the toxic max maximalists. And so like we all owe some sort of debt of gratitude to them in one way or another for fighting that battle for us. Right. They, they went to war with everyone that was dissenting or wanted to turn Bitcoin into something else. And they're basically the reason why we have Bitcoin in the form it is in today. Yet um, we've got the next billion users coming into the cryptocurrency space right now. And uh, I've heard time and time again that the, they just feel very turned off uh, when they ask a simple question like, hey, what about Ethereum? Should I be investing in this? What is the merits of it? Uh, will it actually dismantle Bitcoin or will it overtake it? Um, does it provide something that Bitcoin doesn't? These are I actually think those are great questions and they should be answered with uh, more than just have fun staying poor. Right. It's a it's a lazy answer, but it's uh, it's the brick wall to to your question. <laughs> but I would rather see a door or, or a series of windows that explain to people and, and have them glean a deeper understanding of what we're all doing in Bitcoin for the in the first place. Right on. Yeah, that, that, I guess that makes a lot of sense. Um, with respect to whether or not Bitcoin maximalism is warranted, I can't really speak to that because I feel like it's a group of people that believe one thing to be a certain way and there's no way to really break that up or dismantle those beliefs obviously and the I, I'd like the only solution I guess I can see is um there being a bunch of other people that help fight the the toxicity in the Bitcoin community which I guess pe there are so like there's always a yin to a yang and a, like a lot of other minority groups as well that one either are super ambivalent or are fly on the wall but believe in the same things and uh, won't say anything or you know whatever else I think it's just a group of people so with respect to whether when this toxicity does exist it can be quite um, burdensome if you're new to Bitcoin or you've been in Bitcoin and you post about something that the entire internet community of cyber hornets yeah that's what they're called cyber, cyber hornets, hornets yeah, yeah g get on you like you don't deserve to own Bitcoin or you're not worthy yeah, of being the in the worst. community <laughs> yeah it is the worst and it sucks but what can you do um, like what can you do you can't really regulate what people can and cannot say well, uh, you believe. don't deserve Bitcoin is so counter to the ethos of Bitcoin. It just it it it's actually like it just kind but of rattles my bones a little bit. That's the thing. Bitcoin doesn't care. And exactly. I think once people reach that uh, like that understanding of, oh, these people are just being themselves and uh, like have really hard to get to this point. But I'm not going to let what they're saying get to me and I'm going to continue being on this path. Um, and like realize that Bitcoin actually, actually doesn't care. No other cryptocurrency cares about what the people that are um, either spearheading it or are contributing to it. it does, like no other cryptocurrency really cares about what's happening because it's just a digital thing at the end of the day. Yeah. I, I, expanding on that, uh, no one talks for Bitcoin. No one speaks for Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin doesn't speak. It's it. It's not in and of itself an ideology or a thinking organism or anything like that. Uh, so therefore, no one speaks for it, but people speak about it. But people will speak about it in such a way that they think they're speaking for it. Right. They're like, I'm speaking on behalf of Bitcoin. I represent the Bitcoin ethos and I'm guilty of this in the past. Right. Like we've portrayed through this whole podcast a particular mindset about Bitcoin. And this is the one that we think closely resonates with. The ethos or the values that are captured inside the code base or represented it inside the code base but at the end of the day that's our subjective interpretation of what bitcoin is and what it means to us um i think all i'm really saying here is that no one speaks for bitcoin people speak about bitcoin yeah and that's really important to know but even people speaking about bitcoin can sound like they're speaking on behalf of bitcoin and right. if you're in that part you stumble across that street on Bitcoin Twitter or, or somewhere on the internet, then 
feel really bad for you the, if you've ever you know been there but also we empathize with being attacked on the internet um and hope that you don't let that set you back because at the end of the day what is best for you is what is best for you and that's not going to change no matter what anybody says about it yeah and you got you have to do what's best for you then if you make a mistake by investing in some coin that loses you 50% of your money overnight, then that that's a mistake that you're going to have to have to feel the pain of in order to realize that there's uh, maybe other investments out there that are that are better for you. And, and uh, that's, that's kind of the, the story behind have fun staying poor, right? That's the, that's the elaboration behind where that meme came from. Uh, but I don't hear that meme articulated very often. But you know what, Brad, Brad Mills, our, our buddy at, uh, at Magic Internet Money podcast, I think he's happy to. He's 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 funny, right? Because he'll he'll say the meme and he'll give the elaboration, which is I don't know by orders of magnitude better than just saying the meme, right? It's his. Uh, if you follow him on Twitter, he uh, he'll comment a meme and then he'll explain and in a thread or a series of uh, of tweets. And I I appreciate that about him because Brad is definitely a maximalist. And he uh, and, and he represents it well, I think, because he's he's also got that that compassionate side, that empathetic side that he's like, you know what? I understand the people who want to go and invest in all these see, these altcoins because you look at them and the gains that you can get is hundreds of percents over over a course of a couple of months. It's like you got to be a very strong willed individual to be able to resist that. Right. Because everybody only talks about the gains. Nobody talks about the losses. So if it can get you a hundred percent return on investment over the like a couple of months, that's you never like you have to get in at the perfect time and get out at the perfect time. Cause you can also lose a hundred percent of your investment. Yeah. This is just like slightly an aside, but, um, one of the things that took me just some time, it's just basic math, but it took me some time to wrap my head around, uh, is that a hundred percent gain can be wiped out with a 50% loss. Right. So if you double two dollars, half of two dollars is one dollar, which is what you started with. So when you see a hundred percent gain on something and then you see a 50 percent loss, you have the same amount of the same amount of money that you started with. Even those those, those numbers that you're looking at and playing with uh, weren't the same. Right. Um, so I don't know. That was just. Yeah. Slight tangent. Yeah. Very cool. Well, you actually also wrote an article on Bitcoin maximalism and uh, and toxicity and. Funny thing, you and Robert Breedlove compared it to an autoimmune disorder. Did you read this somewhere before you wrote, wrote it in the newsletter, Keegan? Well, I, I I believe that I got the analogy of an autoimmune disorder from Robert Breedlove. I, I think that he was asked about Bitcoin toxicity on the Lex Friedman podcast. And uh, and Robert's very well spoken. He has a very articulate manner and he, he gave a very good response. And basically he said it's a... Uh, it, it appears to be manifesting as an autoimmune disorder where it actually may be doing more harm to the body, the body being the Bitcoin community, than it does good, right? We talked about the good that the, the uh, Bitcoin toxicity does, defending Bitcoin against um, an actual attack like the four wars of 2017, but we didn't really talk about the bad side of toxicity where it just outright turns people away from and off of Bitcoin, Right. We kind of talked about that. That's the whole people don't talk about uh, for Bitcoin. They talk about Bitcoin. Um, so if you're speaking to someone and they're, they're dissenting uh, or triggering you to uh, to feel like you are not a part of the community, um, just blink a couple times because that person is not speaking on behalf of Bitcoin. They do not represent Bitcoin's values. They are talking about Bitcoin, not for Bitcoin. Yeah, I think this was one of the reasons why Brad wanted to build um, Bitcoin Sherpa. Mm. Because with Bitcoin Sherpa, he, he noticed that people were getting turned away from learning about uh, anything Bitcoin related because there would be these other people that uh, would either be really short on, on Twitter threads or say stuff like nah, have fun staying poor or just would not be the kind of people that a new Bitcoiner would want to follow. Uh, because their beliefs didn't match. So like you very rightly said, if someone says something, um, they're speaking on behalf of their own beliefs, not really on behalf of Bitcoin. And sometimes their own beliefs are something that don't resonate with other newcomers to the industry. So that can be taken as an example of what either Bitcoin stands for or the entire industry stands for. So I think that Brad was starting to notice this problem on Bitcoin Twitter. 
And that is one of the reasons why I wanted to build Bitcoin Sherpa, where, well, the, the site is live, we did end up building it. So if you go there and you put in, you answer a couple of questions, you just see Bitcoin leaders that are, that think like you or um, follow the same ideology as you do. So hopefully if you follow them, you don't have to um, be following the wrong person or the person that you don't necessarily resonate with. And that ultimately ends up making you not go down that path, which, uh, which ultimately, you know, would be a better path if you just follow the right person. Yeah. That was that I, I believe that is what Brad wanted to achieve. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I just want to revisit the whole, um, autoimmune disorder for a moment. Um, like I, the reason why I, uh, like I wrote a, a good section about this, and one of the things that I talk about is the fact that I had an autoimmune disorder. And so I, I, I know firsthand what it feels like to have your body attack itself. And what it feels like is that you don't belong in your own skin. You don't belong in your own body. Uh, but Bitcoin is, is not something that uh, like the Bitcoin community is like for me, like it's a bit of an oxymoron uh, because it's not this closed group of individuals. It's a little bit like oxygen where like we don't call it the oxygen community, right? That's just if you if you're a living breathing organism, you breathe oxygen. And we don't say that you don't have the right to deserve you don't have the you don't deserve to breathe oxygen. I mean, that'd be a, a terrible insult, right? But that that is really how I think about Bitcoin. It's everyone has the ability and the right to use it. And there's no one on the planet that can tell you that you can't use Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin doesn't care. It's going to let you use it regardless of who you are and who you've listened to. And um, and so what an autoimmune disorder does, it makes you feel like you don't belong in the body. The body, in this case, being um, an unbiased, <laughs> uncensorable code base that doesn't care who you are, or where you've came, come from. Um, so I do like the, uh, the analogy of an autoimmune disorder because I think it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I do worry about whatever negative impacts it's hard to weigh whatever positive that has come out of toxic bitcoin maximalism versus whatever negative has come out of it um but uh maybe we'll find out in the future maybe i don't think that it'll deal a fatal blow to bitcoin i really don't uh i think uh i think it's actually a really small loud minority of people that are loud is the key word there yeah exactly yeah well, well, don't be so sure about someone coming um, up and saying, hey, I'm going to capitalize on oxygen and now you're going to have to buy it from me because you don't deserve to um, breathe the air. <laughs> that's the narrative of the Lorax, by the way. And that's that's one of my favorite movies. I recommend everyone go check out the Lorax. Are there two movies? No. Or is that just one? I think they made a Lorax like a while ago, but it was um, it's kind of just them flipping through the Dr. Seuss book and then narrating over it. The actual animated series with Zac Efron and and Taylor Swift, that was it was so good. Series or just movie? Just movie. Yeah, okay. The Lorax the movie. Watch it if you wanna see if a possible outcome <laughs> of the path that we're headed it's down. It's a dystopian future, it's crazy. Yeah. All right. I didn't think that we'd be ending this episode with a Doctor Seuss <laughs> reference. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um everyone, thank you for listening to this episode in our discussion if you wanted to add to something that what we've talked about perhaps you've had experience on the internet being attacked by a random person because they don't agree or believe agree with what you believe and um and you want to talk about it rant about it vent about it our email address is ready at gofullcrypto.com um, know that we are not here to judge you on your beliefs we are here to open we are we are here with open ears to listen to what you have to say and if we don't agree with something that you do have to say it doesn't mean that your opinion is invalid it just means that we have different opinions true yeah so when... uh we should plug the whole rate like subscribe part, <laughs> part of the whole thing we're gonna let you i'll let you do that right okay so if you've been loving our podcast please remember to sub not subscribe um wait it uh, this seems really untimely i don't really want to do a marketing plug but well, we kind of did haphazardly just by me prompting you to do it yeah it was really weird all right anyway thank you everyone for listening well, the, the, the newsletter will be in the show notes yeah the <laughs> <laughs> yes it will and uh talk to you next week <laughs>